number six and homework number seven. PDF versions of both are available on Blackboard starting at noon today if you lose the paper copy I handed out today. First thing is how do you save your data? In this lab environment, we, we have to save our SureTrack schedules to a USB jump drive or memory stick, and those notes are on page five of five of homework number six. So let's look at page five of five and read the notes. <coughs> It tells you, and I'm not going to read them back to you in class, there's some warnings there, but step number three is telling you save your SureTrack schedule files to a memory stick. So what I have on the screen and what you see in the recording is on my 32 gigabyte SanDisk memory stick, I have a documents folder, I have a subfolder for 441, and below that I have a SureTrack folder. Every SureTrack schedule is 25 separate files. If you want to lose a SureTrack schedule, let it stay on the hard drive of the lab PC and it gets erased when it gets rebooted. So don't come to me later and say I lost homework number six because to do homework number 10, you need homework number six. So save everything to a memory stick. Since each SureTrack schedule is 25 plus files, and I will show you the mess that creates on my computer when I look at my SureTrack files under 441. I have 485 files for just a few schedules. You'll notice the names repeat. Each file has a different file extension. The point is a schedule is a database file. SureTrack is a relational database application. All scheduling software is a database. It, Primavera has always done this, it stores the different pieces of data in different files and only the software can open and close the files. You can't go to this view and double click on it and open a SureTrack schedule. So Windows Explorer you use it to set up a folder to save it and then you never use it again. I'm saving everything on my laptop hard drive even for the in-class demonstration. So that's what happens when you use SureTrack. So I have a SureTrack folder on my memory stick. There's nothing in it since I'm saving to my hard drive and for some reason I can't get my computer to look at my memory stick in SureTrack this morning. It's supposed to. So that's the first tip, is the notes on page five. Have you all been able to find the SureTrack software in the start menu? Click on the SureTrack 3.0B, the open, it'll splash screen 3.0C. Is that working for everyone? The first hour it did. Good? That box that pops up, close it. I want all of you to start with the blank gray screen where there's only three menu commands. The first thing I want to do before we even get started is look at page one of the homework number six. There are item number one and item number two, we're going to change some default settings so that the software builds the schedule correctly before you start entering activities. So if you go to the tools menu on the blank screen, And it says on the assignment under number one, under menu command tools hyphen options, then default tab. So I'm going to go tools options on the menu submenu. I obtain the options box and then I want to click on the default tab. You need to make your version of SureTrack look like this screenshot. And that's what's printed on homework number six is item number one. You'll have to deselect, do you have add an activity when a blank row is selected with the keyboard, is that selected? Deselect that or you're going to find the software very frustrating. In other words, if you leave it selected when you cursor down, and yes, I use the cursor keys a lot in software, it will automatically add an activity when you didn't want to. That, for me, personally, is annoying. So I always have it shut off. 
Now, sure track on my computer, I have it shut off and it stays shut off forever. The lab build, it's turned on. Every time you log in, you're going to have to shut it off. So page one of homework six is the first thing you do every time you do a sure track homework assignment in this class and in any class next semester like Connie 487 with Beth Hartman or Connie 488 with me. Always remember to change these default settings so you get the right types of schedules. So that's easy there. Everything else should match the screenshot in number one. Number two is select the project tab, which is the first tab to the left. And we changed this last hour, and I need to change my assignment. We're going to, you need to change the display style to days. Does yours show up as days and hours? Change it to days. You'll notice in the drop down menu, hour is a choice. If you're literally doing a Friday night 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Monday project in a factory and everything's by the hour, you'd want to use planning units of hours and you literally would count the hours. The software can plan at any unit you want. We're going to use whole work days, not fractions, which would be days and hours. The default setting is always days and hours. I want you to use whole planning units of days. The date format looks kind of like military style, but a lot of us like what? We just like numbers like 07021997, and we like the separators to be the slash, forward slash. So I change this to 07021997, and I go down under separators, and I select the forward slash, which is our normal way of typing dates. Even Excel likes that, right? You, you format a column in Excel as a date, and it'll automatically format it like that. So we're changing this in class, and I will change homework number six with a new screenshot and reload it up to Blackboard. The other thing you need to change at the bottom, and I already have this changed on my software, is the default activity type in the lower left-hand corner is all of your show independent. You need to change it to task and leave it set at task on every assignment you ever do until after you graduate. I've taught scheduling standards to contractors and that's one of the things they do is tell their employees make everything a task. When you make it a task, you can resource load it later, cost load it, revenue load it. If it's independent, that does feature shut off. If you enter 20 activities as independent, you'll have to go back and change every one of them from independent back to task and you can do it at any time. If you change it when the schedule has no activities, then you, don't, you aren't faced with this tedious editing process in the future. If you make a mistake and forget to change this, you can change it back to task later, one activity at a time. It is correctable. It's not fatal. It's just slower. So we'll leave these settings. The others we aren't going to take a look at. You can look at these on your own. You know, if you click on view, you want all these things selected. So I'm going to close this dialog box, and that takes care of page one of homework number six. And we still don't have a schedule. What it says in the homework assignment is enter the data listed below into SureTrack. Well, what I want to do, and I need to reorganize the order of this, is I'm going to go through how to open a SureTrack file for the first time. You have two choices. There's the file command, which takes you to the new command. Does that work for everyone? If you leave the current folder for the new project as the C drive on the computer you're working on, that's where your homework will be saved and then it'll be gone because it ends up saving into a temp folder and the IT guys have written it where anything saved in the temp folder gets erased. So you want to change the path to your jump drive. That's why we covered that first. The data field called project name becomes the project file name. That's how it's saved on your memory stick or on a hard drive. So I'm going to call this in class project number one. 
you can type up to 256 characters. It accepts most typing. There are a few illegal characters like the backslash because the backslash is like a subdirectory command. You can't use that. So I just type with normal spaces. I don't use the underscore key and it's fine. The template is set at default. I click on the drop down menu. The next data field is type. Always leave it at SureTrack. The other two types we don't use, so we're not going to use them. But if you do select the drop down menu, you see there's three types. SureTrack is the first. We're going to leave it as SureTrack. We do not select the next box of add this to a new project. We'll leave that unselected. The next data field that I've clicked on is number and version. Number and version may seem to you as this innocuous, who cares? If you want to save your schedules where you can understand what they're about and you have 58 versions, you need version numbers. This is a text field that you can type letters and numbers, anything you want, up to so many characters. Nothing makes it harder to look at a historical schedule than not having numbers and versions. So you may think, ah, it's a homework assignment. In your careers, your schedules, every version should be a separate file name, and every file name should have a separate version number. So it, later when we want to help you build a claim against a client, or you want to defend a claim against you as the contractor that came from a sub, you need to save every schedule version ever. And since the 1990s, electronic files can be discovered with a request for discovery in a lawsuit. So before you were born, the laws in this country changed and electronic files are discoverable in a lawsuit. Under a court order, you have to turn them all over. You don't only just turn over the file box full of paper. More and more people, it's all, or it's all the electronic files. I was involved in a project and in 1997 we turned over all the SureTrack files, and this is new at the time, burned on a CD. And I turned over all my SureTrack files and I learned four years later in a deposition what I didn't do right in SureTrack. So I got severely hammered in a deposition because I didn't have every single version appropriately labeled. So I'm telling you, if you want to have the, the legal protection you need in your employers, believe me, your employers have scheduling standards and how you number and version a schedule will be critical. Here, I'm just going to call it version 1.0. You may have 15 drafts of a schedule before you have a schedule you'll put in your contract with your client, then you'll update it every week, then you come up with another numbering system to update it every week. How that gets updated is between you and your client and what your employer says the rules are. I'm warning all of you, your employers will have rules on numbering inversions and how you save the data. You can't ignore your employer's policies on SureTrack file maintenance. For a Central Iowa contractor out of Des Moines in the summer of 08, I went to six of their offices and taught scheduling standards in the books 50 some pages thick and we went over every little detail. And it wasn't a SureTrack class, it was scheduling standards and procedures and protocols. They were extremely picky. Why? Because in lawsuits and claims, they, when they weren't picky and careful, they couldn't support claims. And the ability to collect a claim or defend a claim could be worth tens, hundreds, or millions of dollars to your employer. And if you don't help them support that as a new hire, they may just let you go. More questions? The question, so it's recorded, is there a general practice? It's all over the map. Iowa DOT, I 235, 2006, 2007, Dr. Jaron and I and two master students were scheduling consultants to Iowa DOT for a fee. <laughs> and what we settled on with the two SureTrack schedulers in the, in the uh, triple joint venture, it's a three member joint venture, a scheduler out of two of the three members scheduled the job. One did the east half, one did the west half. One's a CONI alum, one's a CE alum. And we agreed with Iowa DOT, the version number was the data date. But we said the data date can be printed. Well, we just like you to type in the date that it's current through. So that client, remember the client's always right, the data, the data date became the number version because that client said that made sense to them. Hey, they're the one with the 98 million bucks, client's always right. 
So they answer your questions, whatever the client and or you internally want to do. I know we spent a lot of time on this one. Learn how to use it at your future employer and follow the procedures. When you do a file open dialog box, the number version column shows up so you know which version you're opening. On the file open dialog box, the name of the file, that column is so narrow that you typically only read like the first 10 characters. So you can't tell which version of the file it is, but the number version column tells you you're at version 47, you open version 47, you do a file save as to version 48. That's why we keep the number version box current because it's visible in the file open dialog box. It becomes critical later even when you look at your homework. The start date is always the day you open the schedule for the first time, which is today, September 27th. I don't like that. I'm going to click the drop down arrow and we're going to change that to next Monday, October 1st. On your homework number six and the two assignments in homework number seven, I always pick a date in the future. The date in the future for homework six is every semester someone submits a homework assignment with the start date, the date they created the schedule in the lab doing their homework. And every time we take 10% of the points off for not paying attention to the start date. The wrong start date is 10% of the grade. So you double click on the date. The must finish by box. Never fill this in. I got a phone call from a vice president of operations, a 1985 alum of our program, a personal friend of mine working in the Carolinas. And he said, Larry, I've got this schedule. And the entire schedule, everything turns green and there's no critical path. What's wrong with it? And I said to my friend, I said, just by chance, did you type in a must finish by date? And he said, of course I did. Why'd you do that? Well, that's when I have to be done. So let me guess, you're finishing before that date. Well, of course I am. I said, therefore, there's float. Yeah, everything's got float. That's technically impossible. I said, no, it isn't. Not when you tell the software you need to finish and you finish two weeks ahead of schedule, the entire project isn't critical because you finished too soon. I said, take that date out and click OK. Took the date out, clicked OK, all of a sudden he found his critical path. Yes, he was finishing early in his first draft. I said, do you think you can really finish early? I said, is that, is that what you're gonna put in your contract with your client? I said, I'll let you figure that, that out with your client on this big apartment complex. He subcontracted everything, he was a broker. Did he have the comfort level to subcontract everything and say, I'm gonna be finished ahead of schedule? I don't know what he finally decided, but the must finish by date, here's the opposite. Let's say you put a must finish by date in there and when you build the schedule, every activity turns red and they all have negative total flow. What's wrong? You've missed the must finish by date by weeks. So my advice is the must finish by date, yes, that's in your contract. Build the network and see if you hit it. But when you type it in here, It'll either show activities with all with float, all the activities green, all the activities non-critical, or if you put a date in here you miss, all of a sudden everything has total float, negative 5, negative 8, negative 10, negative 15. What do you do with a schedule with negative float? You, your plan's too long and you need to shorten it up. I leave that date box blank. That's my advice. I'll let you use it at your own rate. Let's take a look at project title. In homework number six, I ask you to type homework number six, and that information is on the middle of page four or five, and we call this bus shelter. If you have the construction template on the PC, the footer is pre-set up to insert this in the footer. That's why I like the construction template is the footers pre-formatted. If you have no template, you have to build everything from scratch. There's nothing there. Yeah, we have a question. What's the difference between project title and project name? Project title and project name. Project name at the top is the name of the file on your hard drive. So I typed IN space class space project space one. That is the name of the file, but then there's 25 files with that name with 25 file extensions. Great question. Project name is the file name. Project title is whatever you type in there and in the construction template will insert it in the footer where you can be printed. Under company name, it's as students always your name. 
I will not accept handwritten names on homework in SureTrack. You will make the software print everything. There is only one assignment, number 10 and number 10A, that I allow you to handwrite on the printout because the software doesn't do something I want you to do. Otherwise, you use the software to print everything. So I'm going to say OK. I have everything I need. I have the file name. It's a construction template. We have the number version of one. We start October 1st, and I, I click OK, and then I get a template that looks like this pre-filled in. Now we're going to go through this next portion pretty quick. The next thing I want to do, step number four on page two of three, talks about the calendar. And let's look at that. Let's look at defining the calendar. The define menu, the first command under the define menu is calendars. It opens here and shows we're at October 1st. Days that are non-work days are cross-hatched. All the Saturdays are blocked out. All the Sundays are blocked out. Let's cursor down to November. And on my computer, I haven't even blocked out Thanksgiving, which is, what, the 22nd this year? So I select November 22nd. It's still a work day. So I select below the non-work command. And now all of a sudden, the 22nd is a non-work day. And in the blue coloring area, it should have crossed hatch November 22nd. It will skip that day calculating start and finish dates. That's what you're telling the software. Let's scroll down to December. Well. Christmas is always December 25th, and this software says, yes, we recognize December 25. What if your client says, I don't want you working on my project on the 24th? I can tell you, in reality, how many people are going to show up for work on the 24th of December when it's a Monday? Oh, about 1%. Do you fire the other 99%? No. You say, have a Merry Christmas, see you on Wednesday the 26th, right? How do you keep your schedule from losing a day? You make the 24th a non-work day. And therefore, it would just skip to Wednesday the 26th. And if 10% of your job shows up on Christmas Eve, you let them work. In the union world, if it isn't a holiday, the job site must be open. If you tell your workers to stay home on a work day by union contract, you owe them a day's pay. If the worker chooses not to come to work on December 24th. Voluntarily, you don't owe them any money. Is that fair? I think that's fair. Does that just mean they can show up they don't have to show up when they want them? Here's the rule of two of my employers. If you showed up on time on Christmas Eve day and worked till noon, five hours would pay you eight. And that was our Christmas present. Everyone gets to go home at noon, eight hours pay. Union contract didn't require that. That was just our policy. We just said, work till noon, we're out of here. Ah, oh, then one was going to stay till afternoon anyway. So we just say, if you'll work five hours, seven to noon, we'll give you, five, we'll give you eight hours paid that day. I'm telling you for the homework, don't make that a holiday. But in the future, let's scroll down and look at January. Well, January 1st is on a Tuesday, just like Christmas is on a Tuesday. So you may decide that Monday, the 31st of December, I found in the union work world, we had the job site open. We didn't give early dismissal bonuses. If you left at noon, we paid you five hours. It's management's philosophy on how to treat your crews, right? If a worker didn't show up on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve, did we lay them off? No, we just didn't pay them. They ended up with two weeks of 24 hours of straight wages. How well does that pay for the Christmas presents? They're hourly workers, right? They're not salaried. You're headed into the salaried professional world. They don't have that benefit. How many people can survive on 24 hours pay two weeks in a row at Christmas? So what we did at one of my employers is we opened the job site on Saturday so they can make up the day and get 40 hours. If we had workers that were literally living paycheck to paycheck, we were open on Monday, we took Tuesday off for the holiday, and we were open on Saturday. We actually wanted to get some work done, but then again, attendance wasn't mandatory on Saturday. And for the worker that was really struggling, they could get 40 hours that week.
because that's how they paid the rent. That's just the philosophy of one of my past employers. We always gave the workers a chance to keep things at home with the family good. Not being paid for the week, 40 hours, could be very tough on a family. So, depends on who you work for. I'll let you think about that as a future leader of your organization. How would you treat your workers? It's easy. How would you like to be treated? Scheduling the job, I always pay Monday before Christmas a non-work day and left Saturday a non-work day, figuring partial attendance on the 24th, partial attendance on Saturday the 29th. And I'd be lucky to get any work done. But for the workers that showed up, they worked. But the crew's so small, I couldn't count it as a day. So I always covered myself by making those days of partial attendance and on work days. That was my management philosophy to manage the, the low attendance and therefore the low daily output. So you see how to set work days and non-work days. Let's see, what else do we need to cover? Be oh, <clears throat> we need to go format columns. You know, I need to pick up the pace here. We have about 16 minutes left. If you have the template, you're working with this. If you have the blank computer with no template, it's very frustrating. So I'm going to edit this to match the screenshots on the bottom of page three, which is paragraph nine, and the top of page four. What it is, is I scrolled down and did two screenshots. So, looking at the bottom half of page three, it says activity ID, description, original duration, remaining duration, and what's missing here, below remaining duration, is actual duration. This table in the columns dialog box behaves like an Excel spreadsheet. If I want to insert a row above early start, I select early start. Select early start, and then above that, you'll find there's a plus key. With the cursor, select the plus key. It will add a blank row above early start. Adding the blank row, I now have to decide what goes in there, and I want actual duration. We have original dur duration, we have remaining duration, and now I want actual duration. I use the drop down menu. There's a few things that are not alphabetical. And a few choices down is actual duration. So this list from top to bottom are the columns left to right. This list top to bottom are the columns left to right. You'll also see column titles, column width, column alignment, fonts, we never change the font, ever. It's Arial, regular eight, just don't change those. So this is the first page screenshot, the bottom of page three of five. What is not correct on here are the alignments. So I'm gonna select the alignment of the activity ID. I, it makes this box blue in color. It lets me edit it in the edit box up above where I hit the drop down menu. The drop down menu gives me three choices, center, left, and right. I like almost everything center justified. So the data in the cell, like in an Excel spreadsheet, stays away from the borders. Is Larry being picky? I am being so hyper picky. I want these things center justified. So you can go through, click on it, go to the menu. That is so slow. So since I've been using PC since before Windows, I like keyboards. I like cursor keys and I like the keyboard. So I'm going to change Activity ID is already changed to center alignment. Description, leave it at left. Original duration, I'm going to start by highlighting original duration's alignment. It's at right, and now using the keyboard, I'm going to hit the C key for center, and it changes it to center. And then I'm going to hit the curse, down cursor key. It saved that. Remaining duration, C for center down cursor key, actual duration, C for center, down, early start, C for center, cursor down, early finish, C for center. Who needs to use the mouse? I like the keyboard. I like the cursor keys and I like the alphabet. Let's cursor down, that takes you to the top of page four or five on homework number six so we can finish editing the columns. 
So I want late start to be center justified. I want late finish center justified. I want total float center justified. I want percent complete center justified. I am now on a row for resource. Resource is not part of the assignment, so I'm going to highlight the word resource, click the minus sign, just a second, and delete that. I have a question. You uh, have predecessors. I'm going to add that. That's the next step. The question is, I need to add predecessors. So I deleted resource. I'm also going to delete the row called budgeted cost. And now, where do I need to add predecessors? It needs to be above total float. So highlight total float. Hit the plus key to add the blank row above total float. Go to the drop down menu. Scroll down till I find predecessors. And I have selected predecessors. So I have predecessors, total float, percent complete, and the row below percent complete is blank. On my computer, it's got late start, late finish, as the width is zero. I need to correct those to 12 as a starting point. So I'm gonna correct the width of the late start column to 12, and I'm gonna correct the late finish column width to 12. It gets us started. The vertical black bar you see, do you also see a slight red edge to that? If you look real, real close, there's one bar parked on top of another to not drag the red bar. And the red bar is the data date, which we don't want to change. The way to not accidentally drag it to the right is don't drag it to the right where there's rows. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the mouse cursor up in the column title field and I'm going to park it on top of the black bar. The red bar is not in the column title field. So by working in the column title field, there's no way I can drag the data date red bar because it's not up there. Yes, I've done this way too many times. I will drag that vertical black bar to expose the number of columns. And you'll notice after percent complete, there is no column label. This controls what you see on the screen. It'll also control what you print. So I'm going to leave all of the columns visible for the moment. That's what you'll need to print on your homework assignment. Now, let's say a column width doesn't make any sense to you. Let's say a column width is too narrow. This is like Excel. If I put the cursor up here and I park it on a border, I get the double horizontal white arrows and I can drag the column width back and forth. You can change column widths like Excel and just drag the width back and forth till it, all your data in the cell is shown. Or you can go to format columns and type in a numerical value. It's editable two ways. Drag it with the mouse or go to the format columns and type in a value. Let's add activities. I'm going to add an activity by hitting the plus button above the blue column titles. And it numbers the first activity 1000. And I'm going to type in in all caps start milestone. Oops, I forgot the last letter. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with start milestone? It has a duration of one. Is that technically correct? What did we learn earlier in this semester? The answer is what? Zero. How do I make it do that? Let's go to the view command. View command. And you'll notice there's only two items selected. Layout toolbar and toolbar. We want to go down to the third item called activity form. And the activity form when I schedule is open all the time. And in schedule updating, it's the only way to update a schedule. If I move the cursor to the bottom black bar, and I know in the back of the classroom it's hard to see it, if you park the cursor on this horizontal black bar, it gives you a vertical black arrow, double-headed with a black line. Holding the left mouse button down, I'm going to drag that up. Just so it's at the middle of the screen. I schedule with this activity form open 99% of the time. I want to see what the details are for each activity I enter in the software. And in updating a schedule, an activity 
actual start and actual finish dates, this is the only place you can enter that. So I leave the activity form turned on all the time, just out of pure habit. There's a activity type box. I took the left mouse button, clicked on the data field, it highlighted the word task. Remember we changed the software from independent to task. If you forget to change it from independent to task, you get to do it here one at a time. We haven't entered any activities, right? We told it they were all task, so therefore it's defaulted at task. But task is incorrect. What's the drop down menu give you? It gives you task, independent, meeting, which I never use, start milestone I use, finish milestone I use, and hammock and WBS work breakdown structure we will not cover in this class. So we're going to use task, start milestone, and finish milestone are the only three we're going to use. Tell the software that's a start milestone and then click the OK button. Now what's its duration? Zero. Is that correct? That's what we're supposed to get, right? Now let's add three more activities. Let's add four. 10,010, I just hit the plus key four more times. 10,010 is going to be activity A. 10,020 is going to be activity B. 10,030 is going to be activity C. And after I type each one, I'm using the cursor key. And activity 1040 is finish milestone. I'll let everyone catch up with your typing. But the next thing we're going to do is change duration. So I'm with the mouse clicking on the original duration cell on activity A. And I'm going to make activity A, B, and C five days long using the keyboard and the cursor key, not the mouse. So I'm going to type five in original duration and hit the down cursor. I'm going to type 5 on activity B for the duration, hit the down cursor key, and I'm going to type 5 on activity C. Now you may think on the finished milestone I could overwrite that by typing a 0. That doesn't work because we need to tell the software it's a finished milestone. So with the finished milestone highlighted, we need to change it from task to finish milestone. And you'll notice the start milestone has no early finish date, and the finish milestone has no early start date. It's what I mentioned in the second week of class, where we use what's consistent with the software. Finish milestones at the start of the work shift, therefore it can't have an early finish, and the finish milestone is at the end of the work shift, therefore it can't not have an early start. It can only have an early finish. This is consistent with what we did weeks one, two, three, four, and five in this class. Everybody with me? I know it may seem like I repeat stuff a lot. I hope it sticks. All right, I am going to, for clarity, drag this black bar over to give me more screen space, just for demonstration purposes. And in the homework, you have to adjust the time scale of the bars. You wanna know how to change this time scale? Put the cursor on the lowest of the three rows where the dates are, because what you see now are weeks. Those are the Mondays of each week. I'm going to stretch this by holding the left mouse button down and just dragging this. How easy can it get? Drag the time scale back and forth till it fits the screen. Let's enter relationships. And I know we're right to the wire here. Let's do activity A, select A. Here's a shortcut in SureTrack that will save you hours of grief. Right click. Right click on any activity you get. The question was, why is the finished milestone the 28th and the activities showing October 5? We haven't given the schedule any logic. The software doesn't know any better yet because we haven't told it what to do. It can't calculate the correct forward pass, so it makes a mistake. The software is only as smart as the person that types it in and it gives you these illogical answers. Homework seven that I gave you, I have mm -hmm. you use illogical logic and I have you use negative, flow, uh, negative lags and you'll see the answer when you print it out. It's not wrong, it's just I want you to see what I told you earlier you should never do. The answer in homework number seven 
one of them is an illogical answer. And the software will do exactly what you tell it to do when you don't use good scheduling practices. One of the solutions in homework seven is something you should never do the rest of your life. And I have you do it once to prove it to you. Let's move on. We need to do activity detail and we want to do predecessors. The predecessor box opens. We'll wrap this up quick. Activity A has no predecessors. Hit the plus key and the drop down list. This shows you every activity in the schedule. On an 80 page SureTrack schedule, this drop down menu is so long, it's five, six hundred activities, which takes a long time to find things. <laughs> Homework 13 to have you CSI numbering so you can find things by CSI division. I do have a SureTrack schedule I could show that's 80 plus pages and it is an insane list. It's approaching a thousand activities anyway. We want the start milestone to be the predecessor to activity A. So I select start milestone. That works, doesn't it? That's too slow. Now let me show you what that looks like. You notice you don't see any activities. Well, up on the toolbar under the word define, there's a three-pronged pitchfork. Do you see the three-pronged pitchfork under the word define? Is it about there in the toolbar? Park your cursor on it and then leave it parked there and a small window pops up that says this is relationship. So I'm going to left click on this once and it turns on the relationships and makes them visible. If you forget that, go to the view menu and you'll notice under view we now have relationships visible. If you want to see them, you got to turn them on. On my 80 page sure track sch schedule, I had to shut them off. It's way too many lines. There's so much vertical relationships in the 80 page schedule, it's a blur of ink. And I literally shut them off. So if you can't remember something, what you want to see on the screen is the view menu. What do you want to see on the screen? So with the view menu selecting relationships, you'll notice you have a finish to start relationship from the start milestone to eight. I'm going to show you the shortcut, and this is way faster. I'm going to drag and drop. I'm going to draw relationships with the mouse. What I'd like you to do is watch the screen, and then I'm going to have you do this as we go. Take the cursor, and from the right, go to the left, toward the end of A, but don't touch it until you get, without touching the end of A, because if you touch the end of A, you'll get a double-headed black arrow, and if you drag it to the right, you'll change the duration. You can change activity duration by just grabbing the end of the bar and yanking on it. So you want the double-headed pitchfork. Now I'm gonna hold the left mouse button down and I'm gonna show you that I can now, it's anchored to the end of A and I'm wiggling the line. Everybody see what I'm doing? I'm gonna take this and drag it and drop it on the left end of B. Not to the left of B, but the left end. Then the software says, is this what you meant to do? Did you want to do finish to start? Yes. Did I want a lag value of zero? Yes. In homework seven, you'll have to change some of these to start to start. Some of these you'll have to change to finish to finish. And on homework seven, some of these zeros become negative and positive numbers. And yes, you can edit this again later. In the shortcut drag and drop, here's where you change it. Or you go back to the predecessor box and you can edit this there. So I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to go back and open the predecessor box, which I closed inadvertently. So here's what I have. I have activity B, activity 1020, as a predecessor of activity 1010. The relationship is finished to start. The like value is zero. If I don't like that, I can select the type of activity click on the type box highlighted in blue in the predecessor box and then go to the drop down menu and change it to the activity relationship that you should have done. These are editable forever. You make a data entry error, no sweat. Go to the predecessor detail box, change the activity type. So you can do the activity predecessors in the predecessor dialog box and some people like that and some like to just drag and drop and get it over with. I'll let you decide what you want to do. So what I'm going to do now is <clears throat> just a 
second, is I want to make B to C start to start. You can even drag and drop start to start. So move the cursor to, toward the left end of B until you get the pitchfork. Is that working for everyone? You have to have a real steady hand on the mouse. I'm going to hold down the left mouse button and I'm going to drag this start to start. If you look at the screen, you'll see that I'm moving it all over the place. And now I'm way too far to the left of C and I'm going to drop it on the left end of C. And the software says, did you mean to type start to start? Yes. Do you mean to have a lag of zero? Nope. I don't want a lag of zero. I want a lag of plus five. So right here, I'm going to change this lag value like you will in homework number seven to a positive or negative value. So I now have a start to start with a lag of five. Now that's five work days, not five calendar days. Then I click OK. What did it do to my bars? You see the gaps here? At the end of A, there's a white space. At the end of B, there's a white space. Why is that? That's Saturday and Sunday. We have the horizontal time scale so stretched out that non-work days show up as white space. If I change that from weeks to months, it would just disappear. If I just keep squeezing the time scale down, the white space almost disappears by doing this. See? But you can still see there's little gaps, right? A non-work day, the, the bar does not show any work taking place. And I stretch it out to exaggerate it so you can see that when you have a two-day weekend, it shows nothing happening Saturday and Sunday. Isn't that a good piece of software? That's what you want to tell you. And how do I take activity C to the finish milestone? I just park the cursor at the end of C. I drag it. And I'm going to drag this to the right-hand edge of the finish milestone. And guess what the software told me? Larry, you drug it to finish to finish. I don't want that. And I found when you're dragging and dropping on finish milestones and you've been doing it for seven straight hours, you get kind of sloppy with the mouse and you'll get the wrong answer. And I intentionally dropped it on the right hand edge of the diamond so that I can fix the data entry error to finish to start with no lag. It can even happen on a finished milestone. You'll drop it on the wrong edge of the diamond. The software is that smart. But you can fix it anytime. If I park the cursor on a relationship and get the black magnifying glass, now I double click on it with the left mouse button. Looks like a ping pong paddle to me later. Ping pong paddle, it looks like a magnifying glass. I left click on that. I get to delete the relationship, I can edit it, I can change the lag value, I can change the type. So the magnifying glass let, lets you just look at the relationship line and just open it and edit it right there without the predecessor box. So there's a third shortcut. How to fix a data entry error or change the logic as you update a schedule. The magnifying glass gives you a one-click access to this box only. It's called edit relationships. That's enough to do homework six and seven. Dog B doesn't have a tail, Larry. Which one? B doesn't have a tail. That's true. So, Mr. McGinnis, now you're in our recording, will give you credit for correcting things. So what do we want to add? Does B go finish to finish with C? Let's do that. Pitchfork on the end of B, drag it to the end of C. It says finish to finish, and I say yes. I now have... All dogs have tails except the finished milestone. We bopped his tail, right? Homework six is to have you build the bus shelter schedule. You'll reuse that file again in homework 10 and homework 10A. Homework seven is pure software training. Negative lags, positive lags, start to start, finish to finish, finish to start, start to finish. And one of the two exercises in homework seven is the illogical. Do it as written so you can see how nonsensical the printed answer is. So that's my tip and warning on homework seven. You will see an odd finish to one of the two exercises. And homework seven is double-sided. That's where the network's drawn. And both these assignments are now on Blackboard Learn. 